Dedication and Author's Note of Stella Fragelius. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick seventy nine. Stella Fragelius by H. Ryder Haggard. Dedication and Author's Note. My dear John Berwick, when you read her history in manuscript, you thought well of Stella Fragelius, and urged her introduction to the world. Therefore I ask you, my severe and accomplished critic, to accept the burden of a book for which you are to some extent responsible. Whatever its fate, at least it has pleased you, and therefore has not been written quite in vain. H. Ryder Haggard, Ditchingham, 25th of August, 1903 Author's Note The author feels that he owes some apology to his readers for his boldness in offering to them a modest story which is in no sense a romance of the character that perhaps they expect from him, which has, moreover, few exciting incidents and no climax of the accustomed order, since the end of it only indicates its real beginning. His excuse must be that, in the first instance, he wrote it purely to please himself, and now publishes it in the hope that it may please some others. The problem of such a conflict, common enough mayhap, did we but know it, between a departed and a present personality, of which the battleground is a bereaved human heart, and the prize its complete possession, between earthly duty and spiritual desire also, was one that long attracted him. Finding at length a few months of leisure, he treated the difficult theme, not indeed as he would have wished to do so, but as best he could. He may explain further that when he drafted this book, now some five years ago, instruments of the nature of the aerophone were not so much talked of as they are today. In fact, this aerophone has little to do with his characters or their history, and the main motive of its introduction to his pages was to suggest how powerless are all such material means to bring within mortal reach the transcendental and unearthly ends which, with their aid, were attempted by Morris Monk. These, as that dreamer learned, must be far otherwise obtained, whether in truth and spirit, or perchance in visions only. 1903 End of Dedication and Author's Note Recording by Patrick 79Chapter 1 of Stella Fragelius by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick 79. Chapter 1 Morris, Mary, and the Aerophone. Above, the sky seemed one vast arc of solemn blue here and there with points of tremulous fire. Below, to the shadowy horizon stretched the plain of the soft grey sea, while from the fragrances of night and earth floated a breath of sleep and flowers. A man leaned on a low wall that bordered the cliff edge and looked at sea beneath and sky above. Then he contemplated the horizon, and murmured some line, heard or learnt in childhood, ending where earth and heaven meet. But they only seem to meet, he reflected to himself idly. If I sailed to that spot, they would be as wide apart as ever. Yes, the stars would be as silent and as far as way, and the sea quite as restless and as salt. Yet there must be a place where they do meet. 
no morris my friend there is no such place in this world material or moral so stick to facts and leave fancies alone but that night this speculative man felt in the mood for fancies for presently he was staring at one of the constellations and saying to himself why not well why not granted force can travel through ether whatever ether is why should it stop travelling give it time enough a few seconds or a few minutes or a few years and why should it not reach that star very likely it does only there it wastes itself what would be needed to make it serviceable well simply this that on the star there should dwell an intelligence armed with one of my instruments when i have perfected them or the secret of them then who knows what might happen and he laughed a little to himself at the vagary from all of which wandering speculations it may be gathered that morris monk was that rather common yet problematical person an inventor who dreamed dreams an inventor in truth he was although as yet he had never really invented anything brought up as an electrical engineer after a very brief experience of his profession he had fallen victim to the idea and become a physicist this was his idea or the main point of it for its details do not in the least concern our history that by means of a certain machine which he had conceived but not as yet perfected it would be possible to complete all existing systems of aerial communication and enormously simplify their actions and enlarge their scope his instruments which were wireless telephones aerophones he called them were to be made in pairs twins that should talk only to each other they required no high poles or balloons or any other cumbrous and expensive appliance indeed their size was no larger than that of a rather thick dispatch box and he had triumphed the thing was done in all but one or two details for two long years he had struggled with these and still they eluded him once he had succeeded oh that was the dreadful thing once for a while the instruments had worked and with a space of several miles between them but this was the maddening part of it he had never been able to repeat the exact conditions or rather to discover precisely what they were on that occasion he had entrusted one of his machines to his first cousin mary porson a big girl with her hair still down her back rather idle in disposition but very intelligent when she chose mary for the most part had been brought up at her father's house close by often too she stayed with her uncle for weeks at a stretch so at that time morris was as intimate with her as a man of eight and twenty usually is with a relative in her teens the arrangement on this particular occasion was that she should take the machine or aerophone as its inventor had named it to her home the next morning at the appointed hour as morris had often done before he tried to effect communication but without result on the following day at the same hour he tried again when to his astonishment instantly the answer came back yes as distinctly as though she was standing by his side he heard his cousin mary's voice are you there he said quite hopelessly 
merely as a matter of form, of a very common form, and well nigh fell to the ground when he received the reply, "'Yes, yes, but I have just been telegraphed for to go to Bewley. My mother is very ill.' "'What? What is the matter with her?' he asked. Then she replied, "'Inflammation of the lungs. But I must stop. I can't speak any more.' Then came some sobs and silence. That same afternoon, by Mary's direction, the aerophone was brought back to him in a dog-cart, and three days later he heard her mother, Mrs. Pawson, was dead. Some months passed, and when they met again on her return from the Riviera, Morris found his cousin changed. She had parted from him a child, and now beneath the shadow of the wings of grief suddenly she had become a woman. Moreover, the best and frankest part of their intimacy seemed to have vanished. There was a veil between them. Mary thought of little, and at this time seemed to care for no one except her mother, who was dead. And Morris who had loved the child, recalled somewhat from the new-born woman. It may be explained that he was afraid of women. Still, with an eye to business, he spoke to her about the aerophone, and, so far as her memory served her, she confirmed all the details of their short conversation across the gulf of empty space. "'You see!' he said, trembling with excitement. I have got it at last. It looks like it, she answered wearily, her thoughts already far away. Why shouldn't you? There are so many odd things of the sort, but one can never be sure. It might work next time. Will you try again? he asked. If you like, she answered, but I don't believe I shall hear anything now. Somehow, since that last business, everything seems different to me. Don't be foolish, he said. You have nothing to do with the hearing. It is my new receiver. I dare say, she replied, but then why couldn't you make it work with other people? Morris answered nothing. He too wondered why. Next morning they made the experiment. It failed. Other experiments followed at intervals, most of which were fiascos, although some were partially successful. Thus at times Mary could hear what he said, but except for a word or two, and now and then a sentence, he could not hear her whom, when she was a child and his playmate, once he had heard so clearly. "'Why is it?' he said, a year or two later, dashing his fist upon the table in impotent rage. "'It has been. Why can't it be?' Mary turned her large blue eyes up to the ceiling, and reflectively rubbed her dimpled chin, with a very pretty finger. "'Isn't that the kind of question they used to ask oracles?' she asked lazily. "'Oh, no! It was the oracles themselves that were so vague. Well, I suppose because was is as different from is as as is from shall be. We are changed, cousin, that's all!' He pointed to his receiver and grew angry. "'Oh, it isn't the receiver,' she said, smoothing her curling hair. "'It's us. You don't understand me a bit. Not now, and that's why you can't hear me. Oh, take my advice, Morris.' She looked at him sharply. "'When you find a woman who you can hear on your patent receiver, you had better marry her.' It would be a good excuse for keeping her at a distance afterwards. Then he lost his temper. 
Indeed, he raved and stormed and nearly smashed the patent receiver in his fury. To a scientific man, let it be admitted, it was nothing short of maddening to be told that the successful working of his instrument, to the manufacture of which he had given eight years of toil and study, depended upon some pre-existing sympathy between the operators of its divided halves. If that were so, what was the use of his wonderful discovery? For who would ensure a sympathetic correspondent? And yet the fact remained, that when in their playmate days he understood his cousin Mary, and when her quiet, indolent nature had been deeply moved by the shock of the news of her mother's peril, the aerophone had worked. Whereas now, when she had become a grown-up young lady, he did not understand her any longer. He, whose heart was wrapped up in his experiments, and who by nature feared the adult members of her sex, and shrank from them. When, too, her placid calm was no longer stirred, work it would not. Oh, she laughed at his temper, then grew serious, and said, Oh, don't get angry, Morris. After all, there are lots of things that you and I can't understand, and it isn't odd that you should have tumbled across one of them. If you think of it, nobody understands anything. They know that certain things happen, and how to make them happen, but they don't know why they happen, or why, as in your case, when they ought to happen, they won't. Oh, it's all very well for you to be philosophical, he answered, turning upon her. But can't you see, Mary, that the thing there is my life's work? It is what I have given all my strength and all my brain to make, and if it fails in the end, why, then I fail too, once and for ever. And I have made it talk. It talked perfectly between this place and Seaview. And now you stand there and tell me that it won't work any more because I don't understand you. Then what am I to do? Try to understand me, if you think it worth while, which I don't. Or go on experimenting, she answered. Try to find some substance which is less exquisitely sensitive, something a little grosser, more in key with the material world or to discover some one who you do understand. Don't lose your heart. Don't be beaten after all these years. No, he answered. I don't unless I die. And he turned to go. Morris, she said in a softer voice, I am lazy, I know. Perhaps that is why I adore people who can work. So although you don't think anything of me, I will do my honest best to get into sympathy with you again. Yes, and to help you in any way I can. No, it's not a joke. I would give a great deal to see the thing a success. Why don't you say I don't think anything of you, Mary? Of course it isn't true. Besides, you are my cousin, and we have always been good friends— since you were a little thing. She laughed. Yes, and I suppose that as you had no brothers or sisters, they taught you to pray for your cousin, didn't they? Oh, I know all about it. It is my unfortunate sex that is to blame. While I was a mere tomboy, it was different. No one can serve two masters, can they? You have chosen to serve a machine that won't go, and I dare say that you are wise. Yes, I think that it is the better part. Until you find someone that will make it go, then you would adore her. By aerophone. End of chapter 1 Recording by Patrick 79 Chapter Two of Stella Fragelius by H. Rider Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Recording by Patrick seventy nine. Chapter two. The Colonel and some reflections. Presently, Morris heard a step upon the lawn, and turned to see his father sauntering towards him. Colonel Monk, C. B., was an elderly man, over sixty indeed, but still of an upright and soldiering bearing. His record was rather distinguished. In his youth he had served in the Crimea, and in due course was promoted to the command of a regiment of guards. After this, certain diplomatic abilities caused him to be sent to one of the foreign capitals as military attaché, and in reward of this service, on retiring, he was created a companion of the bath. In appearance he was handsome also, in fact much better looking than his son, with his iron-grey hair, his clear-cut features, somewhat marred in effect by a certain shiftiness of the mouth, and his large dark eyes. Morris had those dark eyes also. They redeemed his face from plainness, for otherwise it showed no beauty, the features being too irregular, the brow too prominent, and the mouth too large. Yet it could boast what, in the case of a man at any rate, is better than beauty, spirituality, and a certain sympathetic charm. It was not the face which was so attractive, but rather the intelligence, the personality that shone through it, as the light shines through the horn panes of some homely, massive lantern. Speculative eyes of the sort that seem to search horizons and gather knowledge there, but shrink from the faces of women. A head of brown hair, short cut, but untidy, an athletic, man-like form to which, bizarrely enough, a slight stoop, the stoop of a student, seemed to give distinction, and hands slender and shapely as those of an eastern. Such were the characteristics of Morris Monk, or at least those of them that the observer was apt to notice. "'Hello, Morris. Are you star-gazing there?' said Colonel Monk, with a yawn. "'I suppose that I must have fallen asleep after dinner. That comes of stopping too long at once in the country and drinking port. I notice you never touch it, and a good thing, too. There, my cigar is out. Now the time for the new electric light of yours— which I can never make work. Morris fumbled in his pocket and produced the lighter. And then he said, I'm sorry, father, but I believe I forgot to charge it. Ah, that's just like you, if you will forgive me saying. You take any amount of trouble to invent the perfect thing, but when it comes to making use of it, then you forget and with a little gesture of impatience the colonel turned aside to light a match from a box which he had found in the pocket of his cape. "'I'm sorry,' said Morris with a sigh. "'But I am afraid it's true. When one's mind is very fully occupied with one thing—' And he broke off. "'Ah, that's it, Morris, that's it,' said the colonel seating himself upon a garden chair. This, this hobby-horse of yours is carrying you to, to the devil, and your family with you. I, I don't want to be rough, but it is time that I spoke plain. Now let's see, how long is it since you left the London firm? Nine years this autumn, answered Morris, setting his mouth a little, for he knew what was coming. The port drunk after claret had upset his father's digestion and ruffled his temper. This meant that to him, Morris, 
fate had appointed a lecture. Nine years, nine years, idled and dreamt away in a village upon the eastern coast. It is a large slice out of a man's life, my dear boy. By the time that I was your age, I had done a great deal, said the father meditatively. When he meant to be disagreeable, it was the colonel's custom to become reflective. I can't admit that, answered Morris in his light, quick voice. I mean, I can't admit that my time has either been idled away or wasted. On the contrary, father, I have worked very hard, as I did at college, and as I have always done, with results which, without boasting, I may fairly call glorious. Yes, glorious, for when they are perfected they will change the methods of communication throughout the whole world. As he spoke, forgetting the sharp vexation of the moment, his face was irradiated with light, like some evening cloud on which the sun strikes suddenly. Watching him out the corner of his eye, even in that low moonlight, his father saw those fires of enthusiasm shine and die upon his son's face, and the sight vexed him. Enthusiasm, as he conceived, perhaps with justice, had been the ruin of Morris. Ceasing to be reflective, his tone became cruel. Do you really think, Morris, that the world wishes to have its methods of communication revolutionised? Aren't there enough telephones and, and phonograms and aerial telegraphs already? It seems to me that you merely wish to add a new terror to existence. However, there is no need to pursue an academical discussion, since this wretched machine of yours on which you have wasted so much time, appears to be a miserable failure. Now, to throw the non-success of his invention into the teeth of an inventor, especially when that inventor knows that it is successful really, although just at present it doesn't happen to work, is a very deadly insult. Few indeed could be deadlier, except perhaps that of the cruelty which can suggest to a woman that no man will ever look at her because of her plainness and lack of attraction, or the coarse taunt which, by shameless implication, unjustly accuses the soldier of cowardice, the diplomat of having betrayed the secrets of his country, and the lawyer for having sold his brief. All the more, Therefore was it to Morris's credit that he felt the last sting without a show of temper. "'I have tried to explain to you, father,' he began, struggling to fear his clear voice from the note of indignation. "'Oh, of course you have, Morris. Uh, don't trouble yourself to repeat that long story. But even if you were successful, which you are not, <clears throat> I cannot see the commercial use of this invention. But as a scientific toy, it may be very well, though personally I should prefer to leave it alone, since if you go firing off your thoughts and words into space, how do you know who will answer them or who will hear them? Oh, dear father, as you understand all about it, it's no use explaining any further. It's pretty late. I think I'll be turning in. I had hoped, replied the colonel, in an aggrieved voice, that you might be able to spare me a few minutes' conversation. For some weeks I have been seeking an opportunity to talk to you, but somehow you're arduous occupations never seem to leave you free for ordinary social intercourse. Certainly, replied Morris, though I don't quite know why you should say that. I am always about the place if you want me. But in his heart he groaned, guessing what was coming. Yes, but you are ever working at your chemicals and machinery in the old chapel. 
or reading those eternal books, or wandering about, wrapped in contemplation of the heavens, so that, in short, I seldom like to trouble you with my mundane but necessary affairs. Morris made no answer. He was a very dutiful son, and humble-spirited. Those who pit their intelligence against the forces of nature, and try to search out her secrets, become humble. He could not altogether respect his father. The gulf between them was too wide and deep. But even at his present age of three and thirty, he considered it a duty to submit himself to him and his vagaries. Outside of other reasons, his mother had prayed him to do so almost with her last breath, and, living or dead, Morris loved his mother. "'Perhaps you are not aware,' went on Colonel Monk, after a solemn pause, "'that the affairs of this property are approaching a crisis. "'I know something, but no details,' answered Morris. "'I have not liked to interfere,' he added apologetically. "'And I have not liked to trouble you with such sordid matters,' rejoined his parent with sarcasm. "'I presume, however, that you are acquainted with the main facts. "'I succeeded to this estate encumbered with a mortgage, "'created by your grandfather, an extravagant and unbusinesslike man.' that mortgage i look to your mother's fortune to pay off but other cause made it impossible for instance the sea-wall here had to be built if the abbey was to be saved and half a mile of sea-walling costs something also very extensive repairs to the house were necessary and i was forced to take these three farms in hand when i retired from the army fifteen years ago this has involved a net loss of about ten thousand pounds, while all the time the interest had to be paid, and the place kept up in a humble fashion. I thought that my uncle Pawson took over the mortgage after my mother's death, interrupted Morris. Well, that is so, answered his father, wincing a little. But a creditor remains a creditor, even if he happens to be a relative by marriage. I have nothing to say against your Uncle John, who is an excellent person in his way, and well-meaning. Of course, he has been justified, perfectly justified, in using his business abilities, or perhaps I should say instincts, for they are hereditary, to his own advantage. In fact, however directly or indirectly, he has done well out of this property and his connection with our family, exceedingly well, both financially and socially. In a time of stress, I was forced to sell him the two miles of sea frontage building land between here and Northwold for a mere song and during the past ten years, as you know, he has cut this up into over five hundred villa sites, which he has sold, upon long lease at ground rents that today bring in annually as much as he paid for the whole property. Yes, father, but you might have done the same. He advised you to do that before he bought the land. Well, 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 perhaps I might, but I am not a tradesman. I do not understand these affairs. And, Morris, I must remind you that in such matters I have had no assistance. I do not blame you any more than, well, I blame myself. It is not in your line either, but I repeat that I have had no assistance. Morris did not argue at the point. "'Well, father,' he asked, "'what is the upshot? "'Are we ruined?' "'Ruined? Uh, "'That is a large word, and an ugly one. "'No, no, we are no more ruined "'than we have been for the last half-dozen years. 
for, thank heaven, I still have resources and, and friends. But, of course, this place in a way is expensive, and you yourself will be the last to pretend that our burdens have been lessened by uh, your having abandoned a very strange profession which you selected, and devoted yourself to researches which, if interesting, well, they must be called abstract. Oh, forgive me, father, interrupted Morris, with a ring of indignation in his voice, but you must remember that I put you to no expense. In addition to what I inherited from my mother, which, of course, under the circumstances I do not ask for, I have my fellowship, out of which I contributed something towards the cost of my living and experiments, that, by the way, I keep as low as possible. Of course, of course, said the Colonel, who did not wish to pursue the branch of this subject. But his son went on. You know also that it was at your express wish that I came to live here, at Monksland. As for the purpose of my work, it would have suited me much better to take rooms in London, or some other scientific centre. "'Really, my dear boy, you should control yourself,' <laughs> broke in his father. "'That is always the way with recluses. They cannot bear the slightest criticism. "'Of course, as you were going to devote yourself to this line of research, "'it was right and proper that we should live together. "'Surely you should not wish that at my age "'I should be deprived of the comfort of the society of an only child, "'especially now that your mother has left us.' "'Oh, certainly not, father,' answered Morris, "'softening as was his fashion at the thought of his dead mother.' Then came a pause, and he hoped that the conversation was at an end. A vain hope, as it proved. "'My real object in troubling you, Morris,' continued his father presently, "'was very different to the unnecessary discussions into which we have drifted.' His son looked up, but said nothing. Again he knew what was coming, and it was worse than anything that had gone before. "'This place seems very solitary, with the two of us living in its great rooms. I, who am getting an old fellow, and you a student, and a recluse. No, no, don't deny it, for nowadays I can barely persuade you to attend even a bench or a lawn-tennis party.' "'Well, fortunately, we have power to add to our numbers. "'Or at least you have. "'I wish you would marry, Morris.' "'His son turned sharply and answered, oh, "'Oh, thank you, father, but I have no fancy that way. "'Now, now, there's Jane Rose, or that handsome Eliza Layard.' went on the colonel, taking no notice, I have reason to know that you might have either of them for the asking, and they are both good women without a breath against them, and what in the state of this property is not without importance, very well to do. Jane gets fifty thousand pounds down on the day of her marriage, and as much more together with the place upon old Lady Rose's death while Miss Layard, if she is not quite to the manner born, has the interest in that great colliery and a rather sickly brother. Lastly, and this is strange enough, considering how you treat them, they admire you, or at least Eliza does, for she told me she thought you were the most interesting man that she had ever met. Oh, did she indeed? ejaculated Morris. Why, I have only spoken three times to her during the last year. Oh, no doubt, my dear boy, that is why she thinks you interesting. To her, you are a mine of splendid possibilities. But I understand that you don't like either of them. No, not particularly. 
well, especially Eliza Layard, who isn't a lady and has a vicious temper, nor any young woman whom I have ever met. Do you mean to tell me candidly, Morris, that at your age you detest women? I don't say that. I only say that I never met one whom I felt much attracted, and that I have met a great many by whom I was repelled. Decidedly, Morris, in you the strain of the ancestral fish is too predominant. It isn't natural. It really isn't. You ought to have been born three centuries ago when the old monks lived here. You would have made a first-class abbot, and might have been canonized by now. Am I to understand, then, that you absolutely decline to marry? Uh, no, father. I don't want you to understand anything of the sort. If I could meet a lady whom I liked, and who wouldn't expect too much, and who was foolish enough to wish to take me, of course I should marry her, as you are so bent upon it. Well, Morris, and what sort of a woman would fulfil the conditions of your notion? His son looked about him vaguely, as though he expected to find his ideal in some nook of the dim garden. What sort of a woman? Well, somebody like my cousin Mary, I suppose. An easy-going person of that kind, who always looks pleasant and cool. Morris did not see him, for he had turned his head away. But at the mention of Mary Porson's name, his father started as though someone had pricked him with a pin. But Colonel Monk had not commanded a regiment with some success and been a military attaché for nothing. Having filled diplomatic positions, public and private, in his time, he could keep his countenance and play his part when he chose. Indeed, did his simpler-minded son but know it, all that evening he had been playing his part. "'Oh, that's your style, is it?' he said. "'Well, at your age I should have preferred something a little different. But there is no accounting for tastes, and, after all, Mary is a beautiful woman, and clever in her own way.' "'By Jove! There's one o'clock striking, and I promised old Charters that I should always be in bed by half-past eleven. Well, well, good-night, my boy. By the way, you remember that your old Uncle Porson is coming to see you to-morrow from London, and that we are engaged to dine with him at eight. Fancy a man who could build that pretentious monstrosity and call it sea view. Well, it will condemn him to the seventh generation, but in this world one must take people as one finds them, and their houses too. Mind you lock the garden door when you come in. Good night. Really, thought Colonel Monk to himself, as he took off his dress shoes, with military precision, set them aside by side beneath a chair. It does seem a little hard on me that I should be responsible for a son who is in love with a, a damned unworkable electrical machine. And with his chances, with his chances, why he might have been a second secretary in the diplomatic service by now, or anything else to which interest could help him. And there he sits, hour after hour, gabbling down a little trumpet and listening for an answer which never comes. Hour after hour, and month after month, and year after year. Is he a genius, or is he an idiot, or a moral curiosity, or simply useless? I'm hanged if I know. But that's a good idea about Mary though, of course, there are things against it. Curious that I should never have considered the matter seriously before. Well, because of the cousinship, I suppose. Would she have him? It doesn't seem likely, but you can never know what a woman will or will not do, and as a child she was very fond of Morris.' 
at any rate the situation is desperate and if i can i mean to save the old place for his sake and our family's as well as my own he went to the window and lifting a corner of the blind looked out ah, there he is staring at the sea and the sky and there i dare say he will be till the dawn i bet he's forgotten all about mary now and is thinking of his electrical machine oh what a curiosity good heavens what a curiosity ah i wonder what they would have made of him in my old mess five and thirty years ago and quite overcome by his reflection the colonel shook his grizzled head put out the candle and retired to rest his father was right the beautiful september dawn was breaking over the placid sea before morris brushed the night dew from his hair and cloak and went in by the abbot's door what was he thinking of all the time he scarcely knew one by one like little clouds in the summer sky fancies arose in his mind to sail slowly across its depth and vanish upon the inconclusive and shadowy horizon of course he thought about his instruments these were never absent from his heart his instinct flew back to them as an oasis as an island of rest in the wilderness of this father's thorny and depressing conversation the instruments were disappointing it is true at present but at any rate they did not dwell gloomily upon impending ruin or suggest that it was his duty to get married they remained silent distressingly silent indeed well as the question of marriage had been started he might as well face it out that is argue it in his mind reduce it to its principles follow it to its issues in a reasonable and scientific manner what were the facts his family which by tradition was reported to be danish in its origin had owned this property for several hundred years though how they came to own it remained a, a matter of dispute some said the abbey and its lands were granted to a man of the name of monk by henry the eighth of course for a consideration others held and evidence existed in favour of this view that on the dissolution of the monastery the abbot of the day a shrewd man of easy principles managed to possess himself of the chapter house and further extensive hereditaments of course with the connivance of the commissioners and providing himself with a wife to exchange a spiritual for a temporal dignity at least this remained certain that from the time of elizabeth onwards morris's forefathers had been settled in the old abbey house at monksland that the first of them about whom they really knew anything was named monk and that monk was still the family name now they were all dead and gone and their history which was undistinguished does not matter to come to the present day his father succeeded to a diminished and encumbered estate indeed had it not been for the fortune of his mother a miss porson and one of a middle class and business but rather wealthy family the property must have been sold years before that fortune however had long ago been absorbed or so he gathered for his father a brilliant fashionable army officer was not the man to stint himself or to nurse a crippled property indeed it was wonderful to morris how without any particular change in their style of living which if unpretentious was not cheap in these bad times they had managed to keep afloat at all unworldly as morris might be he could easily guess why his father wished he should marry 
and marry well. It was that he might bolster up the fortunes of a shattered family. Also, and this touched him, this commanded his sympathy. He was the last of his race. If he died without issue, the ancient name of Monk became extinct, a consummation from which his father shrank with something like horror. The Colonel was a selfish man. Morris could not conceal it, even from himself, one who had always thought of his own comfort and convenience first. Yet, either from idleness or pride, to advance these he never stooped to scheme. Where the welfare of his family was concerned, however, as his son knew, he was a schemer. That desire was the one real and substantial thing in a somewhat superficial, egotistic, and finessing character. Morris saw it all as he leaned there upon the railing, staring at the mist-draped sea, more clearly, indeed, than he had ever seen it before. He understood, moreover, what an unsatisfactory son he must be to a man like his father. If it had tried, Providence could hardly have furnished him with offspring more unsuitable. The Colonel had wished him to enter the diplomatic service, or the army, or at least to get himself called to the bar, but although a really brilliant university career and his family influence would have given him advantages in any of these professions, he had declined them all. So, following his natural bent, he became an electrician, and now, abandoning the practical side of the modest calling, he was an experimental physicist, full of deep but unremunerative law, and an unsuccessful inventor. Certainly he owed something to his family, and if his father wished that he should marry, well, marry he must, as a matter of duty, if for no other reason. After all, the thing was not pressing, for if it came to the point, what woman was likely to accept him? All he had done to-night was to settle the general principles of his own mind. When it became necessary, if ever, he could deal with the details. And yet this sort of marriage which was proposed to him, was it not an unholy business? He cared little for women, having no weakness that way, probably because of the energy which other young men gave to the pursuit of them, was in his case absorbed by the intense and brain-exhausting study. Therefore he was not a man who, if left to himself, would marry, as so many do, merely in order to be married. Indeed, the idea to him was almost repulsive. Had he been a woman-hater, he might have accepted it more easily, for then, to him, one would have been as the other. But the trouble was that he knew and felt that a time might come when in his eyes one woman would be different from all the others, a being who spoke not to his physical nature only, if at all, but to the core within him. And if that happened, what then? Look, the sun was rising. On the eastern sky, of a sudden, two golden doors had opened in the canopy of light, and in and out of them seemed to pass glittering, swift-winged things, as souls might tread the gates of heaven. Look, too, at the little clouds that in an unending stream floated out of the gloom. Travellers, pressed onward by the breath of destiny. They were leaden-hued, all of them, black, indeed at times, until they caught the radiance, 
and for a while became like the pennons of an angel's wings. Then one by one the glory overtook and embraced them, and they melted into it to be seen no more. What did the sight suggest to him? That it was worth while, perhaps, to be a mere drift of cloud, storm-driven and rain-laden in the bitter night of light, if the morning of deliverance brought such transformation on its wings, that beyond some such gates as these, gates that at times, greatly daring, he longed to tread, lay the answer to many a mystery. Amongst other things, perhaps there he could learn the meaning of true marriage, and why it is denied to most dwellers of the earth. Without a union of spirit, was there indeed any marriage, as it should be understood? And who, in this world, could hope to find his fellow-spirit? See, the sun has ridden, the golden gates were shut. He had been dreaming, and was chilled to the bone. Wretchedness, mental and bodily, took hold of him. Well, often enough, such is the fate of those who dream, those who turn from their needful daily tasks to shape an angel out of the world's clay, trusting to some unknown God to give it life and spirit. End of chapter 2 Recording by Patrick 79Chapter Three of Stella Fragelius by H. Rider Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick Seventy Nine. Chapter Three. Poor Porson. Upon the morning following his conversation with Morris, Colonel Monk spent two hours or more in the library. Painfully did he wrestle there with balance-sheets, adding up bank-books, also other financial documents. "'Phew!' he said, when at length the job was done. "'It is worse than I thought. A good deal worse. My credit must be excellent, or somebody would have been down upon me before now. Well... I must talk things over with Porson. Well, he understands figures, and so he ought, considering that he kept the books of his grandfather's shop. Then the Colonel went to lunch, less downcast than might have been expected, since he anticipated a not unamusing half-hour with his son. As he knew well, Morris detested business matters and money calculations. Still, reflecting his parent, it was only right that he should take his share of the family responsibilities, a fact which he fully intended to explain to him. But in vain is the net spread, etc., as Morris passed the door of the library on his way to the old chapel of the abbey, which now served as a laboratory, he had seen his father bending over the desk, and guessed his occupation. Knowing, therefore, what he must expect at lunch, Morris determined to dispense with that meal, and went out, much to the Colonel's disappointment and indignation. "'I hate,' he explained to his brother-in-law, Porson, afterwards. "'Yes, I hate a fellow who won't face disagreeables, and shirks his responsibilities.' Between Monksland and the town of Northwold lay some four miles of cliff, most of which had been portioned off to building lots, for Northwold was what is called a rising water-place. 
about halfway between the abbey and this town stood mr porson's mansion in fact it was nothing but a dwelling like those about it presenting the familiar seaside gabled roofs of red tiles and stucco walls decorated with sham woodwork with the difference that the house was exceedingly well built and about four times as large as the average villa great heavens what a place said the colonel to himself as he halted at the private gateway which opened on to the cliff and surveyed it affronting sea and sky in all its naked horror show me the house and i will show you the man he went on to himself but after all one mustn't judge him too hardly poor porson he did not arrange his own upbringing or his ancestors ah hello there he is john john oh john he shouted at the stout little person clad in a black alpaca coat a straw hat and a pair of spectacles who was engaged in sad contemplation of a bed of dying evergreens at the sound of that well-known voice the little man jumped as though he had trodden on a pin and turned round slowly muttering to himself oh, gracious me it's him an ungrammatical sentence which indicated sufficiently how wide a niche in the temple of his mind was filled with the grace of his brother-in-law colonel monk john porson was a man of about six or eight and fifty round-faced bold with large blue eyes not unlike those of a china doll and clean-shaven except for a pair of sandy-coloured mutton-chopped whiskers in expression he was gentle even timid and in figure short and stout at this very moment behind a hundred counters stand a hundred replicas of that good-hearted man and worthy citizen john porson can he be described better or more briefly how are you colonel he said hurrying forward he had never yet dared to call his brother-in-law monk and much less by his christian name so he compromised on a uh, colonel oh pretty well thank you considering my years and botherations and how are you john uh, uh, not very grand uh, not very grand said the little man my heart has been troubling me and it was so dreadfully hot in london then why didn't you come away really don't know i understand that it had something to do with the party but but i think the fact is that mary was too lazy to look after the servants while they packed up oh perhaps she had some attraction here suggested the colonel with an anxiety which might have been obvious to a more skilled observer uh, attraction uh, uh, what do you mean asked porson mean oh you old goose why what should i mean a young man of course oh i see oh no no i'm sure it was nothing of the sort mary won't be bothered with young men she is too lazy she just looks over their heads till they get tired and go away i am sure it was the packing or, or perhaps the party but, but, but what are you staring at colonel is there anything wrong oh no no only that wonderful window of yours you know the one filled with bottle glass which always reminds me of a bull's-eye's lantern standing on a preserved beef tin or the top of a toy lighthouse 
Parson peered at the offending window through his spectacles. Oh, certainly. Uh, now you mention it, it, it does look a little bit odd from here, he said. Naked, rather. You said so before, you remember, and I told them to plant the shrubs. But while I was away they let every one of the poor things die. I, I will ask my architect, Jenkins, if he can't do anything. It, it, it might be pulled down, perhaps. Oh, better leave it alone, said the Colonel with a sniff. If I know anything of Jenkins, he'd only put up something worse. I tell you, John, that where bricks and mortar are concerned, that man is a moral monster. I, I, I know you don't like his style, murmured Porson, but uh, won't you come in? It is so hot out here in the sun. Uh, thank you, yes. But let us go to that place you call your den, not to the drawing-room. If you can spare it, I want half an hour with you. That's why I came over in the afternoon before dinner. Oh, oh certainly, certainly, murmured Porson again, as he led the way to the den. But to himself he added, Oh, it's those mortgages, I'll bet. Oh, dear, oh, dear, when shall I see the last of them? Presently they were established in the den, the Colonel very cool and comfortable in Mr. Porson's armchair, and Mr. Porson himself perched upon the edge of a new-looking leather sofa in an attitude of pained expectancies. Uh, and now I'm at your service, Colonel, he said. Oh, yes, well, it is just this. I want you, well, if you will, to look through these figures for me. And he produced and handed to him a portentous document headed List of Obligations. Mr. Porson glanced at it, and instantly his round, simple face became clever and alert. He was on his own ground. In five minutes he had mastered the thing. Yes, he said in a quick voice, uh, this is quite clear, but there is some mistakes in the addition making a difference of eighty-seven pounds three shillings and tenpence in your favour. Well, where is the schedule of assets? Oh, the schedules of assets, my dear John, I wish I knew. I have my pension and there are the abbey and the estates which, as things are, seem to be mortgaged to their full value. That's about all, I think, unless, unless, <laughs> and he laughed, we throw in Morris's patent electrical machine, <laughs> which won't work. Oh, it ought to be reckoned, perhaps, replied Mr. Porson gravely, adding in a kind of burst, with an air of complete conviction, I believe in Morris's machine, or at least I believe in Morris. He has the makings of a great man, no, of a great inventor about him. Do you really, replied the Colonel, much interested, that is curious and encouraging. For, my dear John, where business matters are concerned, I trust your judgment. But I doubt whether he will make any money out of it, went on Porson. One day the world will benefit. Probably he will not benefit. The Colonel's interest faded. Oh, possibly, John, but if so, perhaps for present purposes we may leave this mysterious discovery out of the question. I think so, I think so. But what is the point? The point is that I seem to be about at the end of my tether, although as yet I am glad to say nobody has actually pressed me and I have come to you 
as a friend and a relative for advice well what is to be done i have sold you all the valuable land and i am glad to think that you have made a very good thing of it some years ago also you took over two of the heaviest mortgages on the abbey estate and i am sorry to say that the interest is considerably in arrear there remain the floating debts and other charges uh, amounting to about seven thousand pounds which i have no means of meeting and meanwhile of course the place must be kept up under these circumstances john i ask you as a business man what is to be done and as a business man i say i'm hanged if i know said porson with unwanted energy all debts no assets the position is impossible unless indeed something happens quite so that's it my only comfort is that something might happen and he paused paulson fidgeted about the edge of the leather sofa and turned red in his heart he was wondering whether he dared offer to pay off the debts this he was quite able to do more he was willing to do since to him good simple man the welfare of the ancient house of monk of which his only sister had married the head was a far more important thing than parting with a certain number of thousands of pounds for birth and station in his plebeian humility john porson had a reverence which was almost superstitious moreover he had loved his dead sister dearly and in his way he loved her son also also he revered his brother-in-law the polished and splendid-looking colonel although it was true that sometimes he writhed beneath his military and aristocratic heel particularly indeed did he resent in his secret heart those continual sarcasms about his taste in architecture now although the monetary transactions between them had been many as luck would have it entirely without his own design they chanced in the main to have turned to his that's porson's advantage thus owing chiefly to his intelligent development of its possibilities the land which he bought from the monkey state had increased enormously in value so much so indeed that even if he lost all the other sums advanced upon mortgage he would still be considerably to the good therefore as it happened the colonel was really under no obligations to him in these circumstances mr porson did not quite know how a cold-blooded offer of an advance of cash without security in practice a gift would be received uh, have you anything definite in your mind he hesitated timidly the colonel reflected on his part he was wondering how porson would receive the suggestion of a substantial loan it seemed too much to risk he was proud and did not like to lay himself open to the possibility of rebuff i think not john unless morris should chance to make a good marriage which is unlikely for as you know he is an odd fish i can see nothing before us except ruin indeed at my age it does not greatly matter but it seems a pity that the old house should come to an end in such a melancholy and discreditable fashion oh, oh pity it's more than a pity 
jerked Mr. Pawson with a sudden wriggle which caused him to rock up and down upon the stiff springs of the new sofa. As he spoke there came a knock at the door, and from the further side of it a slow, rich voice was heard, saying, "'May I come in?' Oh, uh, that's Mary," said Mister Pawson. Uh, "Yes, yes, come in, dear. It's only your uncle." The door opened, and Mary came in, and in some curious, quiet way, at once her personality seemed to take possession of and dominate that shaded room. To begin with, her stature gave an idea of dominion, for without being at all coarse. She was tall and full in frame. The face also was somewhat massive, with a rounded chin and large blue eyes that had the trick of looking half asleep, and above a low, broad forehead grew her waving golden hair, parted simply in the middle after the old Greek fashion. She wore a white dress with a silver girdle that set off the beautiful outlines of her figure to great advantage, and with her a perfume seemed to pass, perhaps from the roses on her bosom. A beautiful woman, thought the Colonel to himself, as she came in, and he was no mean or inexperienced judge. A beautiful woman! but a regular lotus-eater. "'How do you do, Uncle Richard?' said Mary, pausing about six feet away and holding out her hand. "'I heard you scolding my poor dad about his bow-window. In fact, you woke me up, and do you know you use exactly the same words as you did at your visit after we came down from London last year?' Oh, bless me, my dear, said the Colonel, struggling to his feet and kissing his niece upon the forehead. Oh, what a memory you've got! It will get you into trouble some day. I dare say, me or somebody else. But history repeated itself, Uncle, that is all. The same sleepy me in a lounge chair the same hot day, the same blue bottle, and the same you, scolding the same daddy about the same window. Though what on earth dad's window can matter to anyone except himself, I can't understand. I dare say not, my dear, I dare say not. We can none of us know everything, uh, not even latter-day young ladies. But I suggest that a few hours with Ferguson's handbook of architecture might enlighten you on the point. Mary reflected, but the only repartee that she could conjure at the moment was something about ancient lights which did not seem appropriate. Therefore, as she thought that she had done enough for honour, and to remind her awe inspiring relative that he could not suppress her, suddenly she changed the subject. "'You are looking very well, uncle,' she said, surveying him calmly. "'And younger than you did last year. "'How is my cousin Morris? "'Will the aerophone talk yet?' "'Oh, be careful,' said the Colonel gallantly. "'If even my grey hairs can provoke a compliment, "'what homage is sufficient for a sleeping beauty?' As for Morris, he is, I believe, much as usual. At least he stood this morning till daybreak staring at the sea. I understand, however, if he doesn't forget to come, that you are to have the pleasure of seeing him this evening, when you will be able to judge for yourself. Now don't be sarcastic about Morris, uncle. I'd rather you went on abusing Dad's window. Oh, certainly not, my dear, if it displeases you. But may I ask why he is to be considered sacred? Why? 
she answered, and a genuine note crept into her bantering voice, because he is one of the few men worth anything whom I have chanced ever to meet. Well, except Dad there, and— Oh, spare me, cut in the Colonel, with admirable skill, for well he knew that his name was not upon the lady's lips. But would it be impertinent to inquire what it is that constitutes Morris's pre-eminent excellence in your eyes? Of course not. Only it is three things, not one. First, he works harder than any man I know, and I think men who work adorable, because I am so lazy myself. Secondly, he thinks a great deal and very few people do that to any purpose. Thirdly, I never feel inclined to go to sleep when he takes me in to dinner. Oh, you may laugh if you like, but ask Dad what happened to me last month with the wretched old member of the government, and before the sweets too. Oh, oh please, please, put in Mr. Pawson, turning pink under pressure of some painful recollection. If you have finished sparring with your uncle, is, isn't there any tea, Mary? I believe so, she said, relapsing into a state of bland indifference. I'll go and see. If I don't come back, you'll know it is there. And Mary passed through the door, with that indolent, graceful walk which no one could mistake who once had seen her. Both her father and her uncle looked after her with admiration. Mr. Pawson admired her because the man or woman who dared to meet that domestic tyrant, his brother-in-law, in single combat, and could issue, unconquered from the doubtful fray, was indeed worthy to be honoured. Colonel Monk, for his part, hastened to do homage to a very pretty and charming young lady, one, moreover, who was not in the least afraid of him. Mary had gone, and the air from the offending window, which was so constructed as to let in a maximum of draught, banged the door behind her. The two men looked at each other. A thought was in the mind of each, but the Colonel, trained by long experience and wise in his generation, waited for Mr. Pawson to speak. Many and many a time in the after-days did he find reason to congratulate himself upon this superb reticence for there are occasions when discretion can amount almost to the height of genius. Under their relative circumstances, if it had been he who had first suggested this alliance, he and his family must have remained at the gravest disadvantage, and as for stipulations, well, he could have made none. But as it chanced, it was from poor Pawson's lips that the suggestion came. Mr. Pawson cleared his throat, once, twice, thrice. At the third rasp the Colonel became very attentive. He remembered that his brother-in-law had done exactly the same thing at the very apex of a long-departed crisis. Indeed, just before he offered spontaneously to take over the mortgages of the Abbey estate. Uh, "'You were talking, Colonel,' he began. Uh, "'Mary came in,' and he paused. "'I dare say,' replied the Colonel indifferently, fixing a contemptuous glance upon some stone mullions of atrocious design. "'About Morris marrying. "'Oh, yes, so I was. Uh, "'Well?' Uh, oh, "'Well, she seems to like him. "'I know she does, indeed. "'She never talks of any other young man. 
is she a who my daughter mary and so why should not they you know really john i must ask you to be a little bit more explicit it's no good your addressing me in business ciphers well well i mean why shouldn't he marry her morris marry mary is is that plain enough he asked in desperation for a moment a mist gathered before the colonel's eyes here was salvation indeed if only it could be brought about oh if only it could be brought about but the dark eyes never changed nor did a muscle move upon that pale commanding countenance uh, morris marry mary he repeated dwelling on the alliterative words as though to convince himself that he had heard them aright oh, th that is a very strange proposition my dear john and sudden too why they are first cousins and for that reason i suppose the thing never occurred to me well till last night he added to himself yes i know colonel but i'm not certain that this first cousin business isn't a bit exaggerated the returns of the asylum seem to show it and i know my doctor sir henry adams says it's nonsense you'll admit that he is an authority also it happened in my own family my father and my mother were cousins and we are none the worse on another occasion the colonel might have been inclined to comment on this statement of course most politely now however he let it pass oh, well john he said putting aside the cousinship let me hear what your idea is of the advantages of such a union should the parties concerned change to consider it suitable uh, uh, quite so quite so that's business said mr pawson brightening up at once from my point of view these would be the advantages as you know colonel so far as i am concerned my origin for the time i have been able to trace it that's four generations from old john pawson uh, the quaker sugar merchant who came from well, nobody knows where although honest is humble and until my father's day all in the line of retail trade but then my dear wife came in she was a governess when i married her as you may have heard and of a very good scotch family one of the camerons so mary isn't all of our cut any more he added with a smile than morris is all of yours still for her to marry monk would be a lift-up a considerable lift-up and looked at from a business point of view worth a deal of money also i like my nephew morris and i am sure that mary likes him and i wish the two of them to inherit what i have got they wouldn't have very long to wait for it colonel for those doctors may say what they will but i tell you he added pathetically tapping himself over the heart though you don't mention it to mary i know it better oh yes i know it better that's about all except of course that i should wish to see her settled before i'm gone a man dies happier you understand if he is certain whom his own child is going to marry for when he is dead i suppose that he will know nothing of what happens to her or perhaps he added as though by an afterthought 
he may know too much and not be able to help which would be painful oh very painful oh, don't get into those speculations john said the colonel waving his hand they are unpleasant and lead nowhere sufficient to the day is the evil thereof oh, oh quite so quite so life is a queer game of blind man's buff isn't it played in a mist on a mountain top and the players keep dropping over the precipices but nobody heeds because there are always plenty more and the game goes on for ever well that's my side of the case do you wish me to put yours i should like to hear your view of it oh, very good it is this here's a nice girl no one can deny that and a nice man although he's odd you will admit as much he's got name and he will have fame or i am much mistaken but as it chances through no fault of his he wants money or will want it for without money the old place can't go on and without a wife the old race can't go on now mary will have lots of money for to tell the truth it keeps on piling up until i'm sick of it i've been lucky in that way colonel because i don't care much about it i suppose i don't think that i ever yet made a really bad investment well, just look two years ago to oblige an old friend who was in the shop with me when i was young i put five thousand pounds into an australian mine never thinking to see it again yesterday i sold that stock for fifty thousand pounds fifty thousand pounds ejaculated the colonel astonished into admiration oh yes or to be more accurate forty nine thousand three hundred and seventy five pounds three shillings and tenpence and that's where the jar comes in i don't care i never thought of it again since i got the broker's note till this minute i have been thinking all day about my heart which is uneasy and about what will happen to mary when i'm gone what's the good of all this dirty money to a dying man i give it all to have my life and the boy i lost back for a year or two yes i would go into a shop again and sell sugar like my grandfather and live on the profits from the till and the counter there's, oh, uh, there's mary calling we must tell her a fib we must say that we thought she was to come and fetch us oh, oh don't forget well there it is perhaps you'll think it over at your leisure yes yes john replied the colonel solemnly certainly i will think it over of course there are pros and cons but on the whole speaking off-hand i don't see why the young people should not make a match also you have been a good relative and what is better a good friend to me so of course if possible i should like to fall in with your wishes mr porson who was advancing towards the door wheeled round quickly oh thank you colonel he said i appreciate your sentiments but don't you make any mistake it isn't my wishes that have to be fallen in with or your wishes it's the wishes of your son morris and my daughter mary if they are agreeable i'd like it well if not all the money in the world nor all the families in the world 
wouldn't make me have anything to do with the job, or you either. Whatever our failings, we are honest men, both of us, who would not sell our flesh and blood for such trash as that. End of chapter 3 Recording by Patrick 79